Hello, I'm Randy Barber, and welcome to Let's Talk Education. This is a chance for you to hear directly from the Boulder Valley School District's team on important topics in our school. As you may know, earlier today, we released plans on the return to our uh, in-person in January. I'm gonna actually share my screen here so that you can uh, see something I'm gonna show everybody. And I do wanna mention that we've got a whole panel of folks joining us today. I wanna thank them all for being here, including the superintendent and Boulder County Public Health. We'll get there in just a minute. Uh, but if I can get this started. Oh, of course, it's not going to work for me. Okay, here we go. If you have questions today, I do want to mention that, as always, we are accepting them at bit.ly. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Let's Talk BVSD. Uh, you can also leave it on our social media accounts where we've got this posted. Uh, our Back Together plan is, uh, is kicking back off on January 5th. We will be welcoming all students back to class, but we will be especially welcoming our preschoolers and our elementary students. Uh, uh, our elementary students will be coming back four days a week. Our preschoolers at that point will be coming two days a week in person. And then as we look through the, the month, uh, a week later, we'll be uh, bringing back our middle school students in a hybrid model that's two days a week. Our high school students will join them on the 19th in a hybrid model. And then finally, in February, we will be bringing our preschool students to four days a week, which is an exciting development. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about today and a lot of questions that have been asked uh, so far. So I'm going to get out of this slide and uh, go ahead and uh, uh, ask Chris Rubina uh, if uh, he'd be willing. Actually, I've got to bring up his slides in a minute here as well. But uh, to first introduce himself and then we'll get uh, started in a little bit of an update about how things are looking with public health right now. Great. Thanks, Randy. And thank uh, Superintendent uh, Rob Anderson and your team for allowing me to come and speak today. Um, I'm Chris Urbina. I'm the medical officer for Boulder County Public Health, and I'm uh, presenting the slides and the update. Jeff usually does these slides. I think he had another commitment. Um, but I'd, I'd like to share where we are in Boulder County and talk about why we're feeling comfortable uh, supporting the recommendations uh, with um, uh, Boulder Valley going back to their schedule that Randy just outlined earlier. So I, I'm going to cover the highlights of these slides. I know there's a lot of detail, but I, just, just so you know and the audience knows and just a kind of reiteration of what we talked about this morning, we're improving. Um, we are decreasing our uh, two-week cumulative incidence, which means that our cases are going down. Uh, we're also improving our positivity rate, and I'll talk about each of these things. And we're, but we're also, most importantly, dropping our hospitalizations. So if you compare us, and this slide compares us to other counties in the region, we're that little red line at the bottom. We ha all of us had a big peak uh, earlier in uh, late November and early December, but uh, fortunately we didn't uh, get the big uh, 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 increase in cases that we expected after Thanksgiving, and that's a good thing because that means that everybody uh, um, uh, put on their uh, dress shoes and they, they covered their faces and they uh, did social distancing and limited gatherings. And so we actually see our cases in our region declining. And we're that red, and you can see we're a, one of the lowest uh, communities in the Denver metro area. Next slide, Randy. So this is another way of looking at it. If we look at the five-day average of new cases, that was the two-week incidence, we're actually seeing a significant drop um, in our cases, if you look at that big peak that you see over November and uh, late November, we, we spiked at that point, we started to have plateau, and then actually we're down to 88 cases per 100,000 population. And that's, that's a very good thing. That's a very positive sign. Next slide. And the other important thing, and I think I want to spend a little bit more time on this slide, and you see a lot of squiggly lines here, but if you look at the uh, different colored lines, you'll see that the zero to nine group, which is that dark greens uh, at the bottom of it, is our lowest uh, rate of cases in that two-week incidence period. So that's a very good sign, and that's why we're feeling very comfortable that the K through five and the early childhood uh, centers, uh, those because their cases are low to begin with, and they're decreasing. That that that's supportive of the recommendation going forward. But you do see a slightly higher average if you look at the. 10 to 17, that's the orange line right in the middle. The cases are a little higher, and I'll talk about this more, but they're a little bit higher in those populations, and we expected that because there's more socialization not only uh, on campus but off campus, and so we did see a spike, but those cases are also going down. So that's supportive to me to see that, that, that um, 
that probably a hybrid model is, is reasonable to uh, open schools up with. But also you see the cases all around, and I'm most excited about you know, the cases dropping in the 75, uh, 65 to 74, as well as the 75, because that's where we're seeing the significant mortality uh, and, and hospitalizations. And since I'm over 65, I'm really glad my colleagues are, 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 uh, are, are doing better in that community. Next slide. Uh, this is an important one to talk about. I think I talked about the dial earlier. We, we saw a peak in our hospitalizations at the end of November, and then we saw a significant drop, and that was good because you know there's a two-week uh, uh, time period between when you see a new case and the potential for hospitalizations. We saw a, a drop, but again, they're starting to rise again, and I do think that's worrisome, and we're, we're going to be watching that very closely because obviously hospitalizations mean that there are people that can't, uh, who got COVID-19 or who are suffering significantly. And I wanted to point out that we see hospitalizations in all age groups. Early on in the outbreak um, and the pandemic, we saw uh, people that were older uh, that, and with chronic medical conditions. Now we're seeing a much younger or age group. So everybody is, it's important to point out that everybody could be potentially hospitalized if they get infected. Next slide. The point of this slide, I know there's a lot of squiggly lines here and lots of different colors. I, I, the title says it all. Masks can make a major difference. And if you look at that, that purple line at the bottom, where when, when we, we implemented strategies um, to require masks, if we continue on this trajectory of that purple line, we see we plateaued with the cases as we implemented different strategies. But if we were to able to get a significant number of people obviously the more the better, we could see a significant drop in the number of daily infections as well as projected deaths. And that's the value of seeing that any of the interventions that we've talked about, and we'll talk about the layered approach a little bit later, and I hopefully there's questions about it, masks do make a difference. And we can see that in the data, we can see that in the research, and we can see that, uh, it, it, that they do make a difference. Next slide. There are a couple of reports that I wanted to highlight. Uh, there was one that was put out, uh, put out by the, the State Health Department, CDPHE, and the other one was put out by the Metro Denver Partnership for Health, which is we were part of in Boulder County. But that includes all the pu other public health directors um, in, in uh, the Denver metro area. And they, they, they came up with several conclusions that I'll talk about now. Next slide. So one was the strategies from, from our, our, our sister support agency, the Colorado Health Institute, that really talked about the, the when they reviewed the literature, we found out that significantly younger children, and, we, and again, our data supports this, is that younger, younger children appear to be less susceptible to COVID-19. And if you look at studies nationally, that, that particularly those kids that are younger than 10 years of age, more than adults, appear to have a lower risk of transmitting COVID-19 to others. And that may be because of the viral load, um, but also that may be because of the socializations. Now, we all know that respiratory tract secretions are the reason why people get the infection, but we think that young children uh, are not spreading it in the household and certainly are not spreading it in the schools, and we'll talk about that layering approach. So that, so that when you weigh the, weigh the evidence and the research that the in-person learning appears to have a minimal impact on community transmission. And that's why I think, again, we're feeling very comfortable making the recommendations going forward and supporting what uh, uh, Boulder Valley is doing. Next slide. So this is a, a report that was produced by the Colorado State uh, Department of Public Health and Environment that re really looked at that, uh, that report and looked at the research. They basically took another swipe at the uh, at, the, at the research and the studies, and they suggested that there's certainly a lower risk for kids uh, K through five, a slightly higher risk for grades six through eight, and a slightly higher risk of school-age children. Again, remember when we looked at the data earlier, those populations are, are at the lowest part of it. Kids are not passing it in schools, um, uh, and there's still a slightly higher risk in the older age groups but still, it's overall a lower risk in the school settings. So in general, transmission appears to be happening not only at the school level, 
but in interactions that occur outside of the school day and then brought into the school as opposed to widespread transmission occurring in the schools. And this is supported very closely by talking to our epidemiologists in Boulder County, as well as, as you know, I work with the other counties as well in the Denver metro area. And they say the same thing. The contacts that the contact investigations that we did show that the kids likely got it from a household, from one of their parents from work, or through a school extracurricular activity out there. Next slide. So this is our key messages, basically in summary. That that, and I'm going to switch this out because I think it's important to differentiate. And I tried to do this this morning. And I try to do this in every talk. It's our not your, our individual decisions have an impact, whether or not we're in schools, in businesses, you know, every, everybody is impacted by what we do in our behavior. So schools are a part of that community. So, so uh, business is affected, our quality of life, and certainly hospitalizations and deaths. We, we have overemphasized of saying you are, the, you are the problem or you have to change. It's really all our behavior. I think as, you, as we've talked about before, many times on these community sessions is that school environments provide stability, they provide mental health, they provide support for each other. We're very concerned that, that kids have been suffering, and I know there'll be lots of questions from parents when they're at home, but we want to see them back in school. And so our research says that we should prioritize K-5, uh, K-5 through full in person, and then grades 6 through 12 in person hybrid until out of our severe risk. And I think I talked about that severe risk earlier. So next slide. So it's really up to us, and, and I'm not going to belabor this point. I kind of covered that. Uh, uh, we know that transmission is still high, and 50% uh, and of our population don't know they have the disease or are symptomatic or asymptomatic. So we have to all be aware. And all of the things that we've talked about, you know, and, and we'll probably, there'll be some questions about masking, physical distancing, but all the things that the schools have implemented have really have been uh, tremendous in my, in, my, in, my, in my opinion. And I think that the schools are safer places for kids to be. And of course, uh, we all want to uh, get them educated and, and have that interaction. So going forward, uh, we're encouraging people not to do holiday travel, uh, decrease their social gatherings, wear masks, and Vaccines are on the way, and that's hopeful. Next slide. And I know there'll be lots of questions about back, uh, vaccines. So it's up to us. Uh, our rates are going down. We'd like to continue to see that trend going forward. Final slide, I think the final slide is coming up here. Yeah. So what, what again, it's not what you do. It's what we all do that matters, wearing a mask. I just want to point out one thing on this slide. There is an app out there available if you want to sign up at, at the CDPHE website to identify if those who use smartphones, they can identify people who may be in, uh, have been exposed, and that's a very helpful tool, but obviously we know all, all the things that we need to do. So I'm going to stop there, Randy. I think that's it, and, and, and then have uh, the, the process go forward, and I'll be around for, to answer questions with our team. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. We really appreciate you. And uh, I do want to say, as I introduce uh, the superintendent, that, that I know all of our, uh, our whole leadership team is very, very appreciative to both, both the agencies that you actually work for, for Broomfield County Public Health, as well as Boulder County Health. Um, it's, you know, during a situation like this, we, we have to have a great partner, and we have been so lucky to have you guys. So thank you, Chris. Uh, speaking of the superintendent, I, I do want to give a chance for him to give us a little bit of insight following the decision. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Rob, well, and I should say hello, Rob. <laughs> hey, Randy, how are you? I'm doing okay, running right into it. Um, first and foremost, uh, the safety of our students and staff has been at the top of mind. And as we look ahead, uh, you know, we were just talking to our partners in public health. We, you know, we're closely working together. We're closely monitoring the situation. Um, you know, for a while there, you know, we were, we were definitely concerned about the situation. Absolutely. I think that, you know, um, as, as we work very closely with both Boulder uh, County Public Health and Broomfield Health, um, and we're checking in on a constant basis. We're always often looking at, at all of the, the most recent data, and we really rely on their expertise to interpret that data to provide us advice as we make these decisions. Um, and so case rates are going to be something that we continue to monitor. Obviously, we rolled out 
a plan we feel really good about today um, and is supported uh, by both Boulder uh, County Public Health and Broomfield Health. Uh, but we'll continue to monitor cases. And if there happened to be um, a large spike uh, before January 5th, that would be something that we would be um, in daily conversations with them and uh, we'd be quick to act. And I would say that throughout this pandemic that, that the district Boulder Valley Schools has, has proven that we'll be quick to act if we feel like the data um, shifts in a way um, that, that, that just creates the dynamic for us to be able to have in-person learning. And so we commit to continuing to do that. I think it's really important for our community, or our community to know how committed that, that we are here in Boulder Valley Schools to, to follow the data science and the expertise of our health partners. Excellent. Um, I know that, um, you know, as we looked at this, and I kind of talked about this before, we're looking at a staggered and differentiated approach as we come back in. Uh, this really, you know, started with our, the feedback that we got from our working advisory group. Um, and it's something that we feel like worked uh, in terms of us being able to, you know, be able to sort of uh, be able to, to pivot as, as we were putting students back in and make adjustments if things weren't working properly. Um, it, it was important for us to do this again, right? No, oh, absolutely. I think that, that we learned a lot um, over the course of the past um, semester, a lot about this, this virus, a lot about um, the challenges that, that, that school districts, not just Boulder Valley, face operationally. Uh, we feel very comfortable with a staggered start, staggered approach. It allows us to get up and running quickly. And Randy, you know, our goal isn't just to open. Our goal is to stay open. So I would say that I'm really proud of with some of the innovative uh, strategies that the district has taken on. I want to thank our community. We, we have over 200 classroom monitors already signed up, and I know that we have numerous health monitors. Uh, we put a call out to our community to, to help us and, and lock arms so we could return back to in-person learning, and our community has absolutely responded, so I'm so thankful and grateful. Um, we're also um, adding air purifiers K through 12, and so every classroom will have an air purifier, another layer to ensure that not only our kids and, and adults are safe, but um, you know this is, this is just something that we've learned about the virus, that ventilation and, and air purification are things that can certainly help uh, reduce that transmission. And we're going to be increasing student testing. I'm sure that, that we'll be getting some questions around that. It's not only important that if kids or anybody in our community is feeling like they have symptoms to get tested so you can take the proper quarantining precautions. And for us, it's also important for us to be able to test our asymptomatic students. Uh, if they've been exposed, then we want to make sure that we have the, we'll be able to provide that, those, that, that testing. I'm proud to announce that we're going to have a new testing site for not only for students, but for parents, employees, community members. Uh, that will be at uh, Centaurus High School starting at the end of this month. I believe the date is, is December 28th. Uh, again, another resource. We want to make it convenient to be able to test. We want to increase the testing. We know that that's a mitigation strategy. And so we're excited that we're doing all of these things. We know how important going back to, to in-person school is for all of our kids, our families. I could tell you in the Anderson household, my kids are thrilled that they're going to have the opportunity to go back to in-person learning. Uh, but we're always going to make sure that we're putting the safety of our kids and our employees uh, at the center of this decision, along with our health partners to make and decide uh, what it is that we need to do. As, as you were just saying, there was some great news for a number of different groups. Uh, we mentioned about the preschool and our, our one of our priorities is about our youngest learners, and so it's great to hear that they'll be back four days a week. Um, I know that early on, you know, throughout this last semester, as we had high school students in one day a week, uh, now now we're going to two days a week. Uh, that obviously is, is a very, uh, you know, big deal. Uh, I know we're going to talk to Chris about some of the, the, the questions that come around, you know, why can't they come back more days a week? But um, I, I did want to have you specifically address you know, uh, there have been questions about, you know, are, are, have, are we leaving out our high schoolers? Do we not care about them? Uh, you yourself have a high schooler. I care deeply about them and everyone else in our district. On behalf of all of the kids in Boulder Valley Schools, she's a, I promise you every night at dinner she advocates for your return to school. Uh, it is, uh, the data and science is clear around this, and I think you heard Dr. Urbina Bina share that the risks and the way that this virus spread is different from, from zero to nine and from 10 to 18. And you have to pay attention to that. If we're gonna be committed to the data and science, uh, that states very clearly. And I would say that in, in our district and talking with other superintendents across the metro area, they've all seen the same thing um, in the sense that, that the, the spread was more pre prevalent with that age group. And so two days a week, uh, we feel like is a great place to start. Um, and it's something that we'll continue to monitor. As community cases come down, as the, as the vaccine becomes more prevalent, as we start to see that happen, you know, we hope to be able to enter kids in even more than two days. At this point, we feel like it's the right place to be. 
um, and um, I'm really comfortable with, with that decision. I know I touched on this in the last question, but I want to specifically say this uh, or ask this question. Uh, we, of course, recognize the heavy impact that the pandemic had on all involved. Uh, what do you want to say to our parents, students, and staff? Um, this has been a heavy lift for everyone. Uh, the challenge of my lifetime, I know for many of the professionals in education, um, for many of the parents and friends um, throughout our community, it's been just been incredibly challenging. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we're here for your kids. We will continue to be here for you and your students. I would say that, you know, as we move into January and we get schools up and rolling, I promise you that Boulder Valley School District will be thinking forward on what are the next steps. How do we make sure that we catch kids up academically? How do we make sure that we attend to their social emotional needs? We've already had meetings on that. We'll be rolling that formal plan out to our board in February. Um, and so we're going to continue to try to look forward. Uh, you know, I know that um, this, we, we've been in this for a year. Uh, it's going to take us more than a year to, 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 to catch everybody up to where we think, feel like they need to be. Um, and we just have to continue to be together. But, but our commitment here in the district is that we will continue uh, to make sure that we're supporting, uh, putting the needs of our kids and families at the forefront of what we do um, and working hard to make sure that uh, everybody is okay um, and is, is making the, the right amounts of academic progress. Now, and this, of course, is the last day of school for this semester. Uh, a lot of folks are going to be going off to winter break here. Um, this may be one of the last events for many of our staff members before they go off, uh, parents obviously, uh, as we all go and celebrate the holidays. What do you want to say to everybody or what's on your mind as we go to break? Just thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for everything that you've done to support us, for your patience. I understand there's frustrations. I understand that, that some of, of our kids are struggling um, and that some of our families are struggling as well. Um, continue to, uh, you know, we're here to support you. I want to thank you for everything. Uh, that you've done and will continue to do to support us. Uh, the best way to, for us to make it through this is together. And so I'd encourage our entire community to come together, uh, practice the health measures that we know that prevent the spread of this virus. Our community has done uh, an incredible job. I know that many of us were worried after Thanksgiving that there was going to be this huge spike. It didn't happen. Um, I would, I, and I, com I commend our community for, for stepping up and making those sacrifices. And, and I know that we will continue to do that. I know that I've heard loud and clear how important in-person learning is uh, for our families and for our kids. Um, so let's work together. Let's lock arms. Uh, let's make that happen. And let's not only get back to school, let's stay in school um, as we think about the next semester. Awesome. I, I think all of us are with you. We cannot wait for kids to be back. Um, we are going to open up to the panel now and ask some questions. Uh, but I think the segue that you just made was, was perfect. We have gotten some feedback. And I think one of the, these top questions, Rob, may have a little bit of a uh, bit for you in here as well. Um, but I do want to ask, you know, a lot of questions have come in, both from staff and, and from our parents as we got ready for this show in regards to the timing of, of all this. And, and we knew, as, as uh, Dr. Robina was saying, you know, we were really monitoring, thinking that we were going to see a spike at, at Thanksgiving. And so one of the questions that we got was uh, uh, in regards to, uh, you know, how will you plan uh, for uh, increases, planned increases for people traveling uh, Christmas, New Year's that didn't travel for Thanksgiving? Um, you know, uh, also the idea of what, what do we consider safe as, as that happens as we're looking at that. Um, Dr. Rubina, I know that we're going to be really monitoring these cases. Um, what are you guys looking for as we do this and what would be your, your advice to folks as we look at specifically New Year's? I think that's a great question. I think that's, people, that's on people's mind right now. They're, they're thinking family, they're thinking holiday celebrations. How are they gonna all do this together? And I guess, my advice would be, as Rob talked about earlier, is you know reduce the amount of social gatherings. Now is not the time to let let it go, just because we've had a drop in the number of cases. In fact, we should actually step it up to re to continue those prevention strategies of uh, of wearing a face and facial covering indoors and outdoors, limiting the number of of contacts that you have with people outside your household, uh, of continuing to wash your hands, disinfect not go to school or work, in this case, not go to work or settings if you're sick and ill, anything that, or sick, excuse me, if you're sick or ill, uh, anything you can do to continue this downward trend in number of cases will increase the likelihood that all of us will be safer. And I think the, 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 the and if you have any of those symptoms, now that testing is available, not only in our community and are gonna be available at the schools, if you have any concerns, get tested. 
because I think if you get tested and we can say you're positive, go home and wait it out and, and remove yourself from that setting, then we de again decrease the likelihood that you can continue to spread. As I mentioned earlier, 50% of our cases are asymptomatic, so you may not know that you're, you're spreading the illness. So if we can eliminate that, that's what I would encourage people to do. There's no way we can time. There's, you know, the questions I often get is, can I time, I, can I be in quarantine for 14 days before I leave, and can I come back, can I do 14 days? Well, we just don't that know that's an effective strategy. I think if you do those prevention strategies right now, you can reduce the amount of infection while we talk about the vaccine. And I know there'll be lots of questions around the vaccine, so I'll hold off on that discussion. So, um, I'll, I'll just uh, bring up another question. You know, I, and, and we were talking about between you know, before the show that my analogy for this is a little bit like the game of operation, where you know, as we're dealing with this, uh, when we were closed, uh, all, all a lot of folks were uh, talking to us about the fact that we should be open and be open more, et cetera. Right now, as we start to talk about, uh, you know, opening, we certainly have people that are now getting very concerned about the fact of, you know, uh, like this person was saying, you know, with more than 3,000 lives lost, uh, you know, now, now every day, it's, uh, you know, please keep in mind, you know, that we can, you know, essentially was saying that we should go to online learning and stay there, that kind of thing. Um, as we look at, we talked about the layers of uh, protection. What we see is when those layers are in place, schools are, 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 are pretty darn safe places. Is that a comment for me or? or yeah, uh, anything that you want to add to that? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I said when Rob and I and, and Jeff, we started first talking about this. I don't know if you remember that first meeting press conference we had at Boulder Public Health. Um, we were concerned. We didn't know the impact of this illness on our communities. And, and we were very cautious early on. And we said, let's think about this. Let's follow the trends. Well, now we know. We've had two significant surges. We know how this disease is spread. We, we put in place all the prevention strategies. Now that you've added the micro filters, you've added support groups, you've come up with a plan, you know, uh, and put, put in place these layers with the testing. I think that schools are going to be extremely safe places to be. Not 100%, nothing is 100%, but I believe the, that, that and, I, and Boulder Public Health, uh, believes that it's it's a time to get our kids back to school. There's certainly very important values that happen um, and learning and socialization and, and mental health services, all the things that you've all put into place for staff, students, and, and, and families. It, it's time to get back to school. So I, I fully support that. And I think this, this part's for, for Rob. You know, again, kind of going back to the idea of, uh, in our letter, we talked about if it is safe. Uh, and I think, you know, a number of people have written us and have, have asked the question about, uh, you know, we go a couple of weeks and then there's a surge, you know, how will we know if we have to stay home? I know that you addressed this with our staff this morning. Uh, we're, this is not something that we take lightly. Yeah, absolutely not. And I think that is, as this has evolved, as, as Dr. Abina shared, you know, we've learned more. We've, we've you know, um, we, in the beginning, we were absolutely and rightfully so incredibly cautious. And I think that what you would see and what we've seen across the Denver metro area and across the country is the incredibly low transmission rates in schools. And so whether it's Boulder, Colorado, or um, there's, being, there's a study that's been done by Brown University that has really rolled this data up across the country, and that, they, that, that schools are, low, are places of low transmission. Um, and, and we'll continue to watch this and we'll continue to learn. And if there's a decision that we need to make, we're not afraid to make it. Again, I think that we've been very quick to act. Um, but, you know, to Dr. Abina's point, there's a cost of not kids not going back to school. We know that that's where they learn the best. We know that's where that way we can take care of most of their needs. You know, they, 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 this isn't an equal equation of remote learning versus being in person. Now, I will say, and we've surveyed our students, that our teachers are doing an incredible job this fall with, with remote learning. Uh, they've given us survey results that have told us it's way better than the job that we did in the spring, as we would expect. But what, for, what I know and what educators know and what a lot of our parents in our community know is that it is the modality of remote learning that doesn't work for a lot of our kids. And so uh, we have committed to getting kids back to school once it's deemed um, that we've mitigated the risks and the risks are low enough to be able to do that. Um, the cases are not surging. They're on the decline. They've been declining for the past month. 
We've added additional mitigation strategies, including um, more testing, air purifiers in every single classroom, classroom monitors, health monitors. Uh, we can maintain all of the layers that we've had in place that worked while we were in person. And we had incredibly low transmission rates. I would say less than 1% of, of folks that were quarantined actually came down uh, with, uh, with COVID-19. And so those were the folks that were exposed. So, uh, and, and I do think that we've taken some steps to make sure that we uh, overcome the operational challenges. Uh, with the classroom monitors, you know, we've been working with teachers with exemptions. Uh, those numbers have been have been shrinking, and we've been we're able to be um, operating at higher levels. I know that there were some concerns and emails we were getting in regards to that. Um, that's not going to be an issue as we move back here in the spring. And so, um, all that to say that certainly we take the, the the health and safety of everyone very seriously, and that we know that in-person learning is the right thing to do and what our kids need. Uh, there's been, and, and as Dr. Urbina shared. Uh, numerous medical experts within our community, whether it's CDPHE, the Governor's Task Force, um, the Metro Denver Health Partnership, all have come to the same conclusion. When the cases come down and you, and you can go back to school, you should do it, and you should do it as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, I know uh, Stephanie Barron is on, on, on the line here as well. Uh, she's our Director of Health Services. And this, is, this has been a really wild ride. Uh, I know when you, we talk about, you know, staying open, uh, another element of this is really being able to stay up with the, the amount of uh, cases that we are seeing coming through, contact tracing, quarantining, those kind of folks, that kind of thing. Um, you guys have really uh, solidified your place, I would say, as being a frontline worker um, and have played an active role in, in all that investigation, contact tracing, et cetera. Uh, this process is especially in, in, uh, important in, in preventing the disease uh, transmission. Is that, how, how, can tell us a little bit about how that works. Um, th that whole uh, process, like you mentioned, Randy, um, of actually uh, being able to, to identify students and staff who are, who are ill, and making sure that they're home, that they get tested as quickly as possible, and if they have been um, at school or at work while infectious, identifying those folks, getting them good information on what to do and how to um, stay home and quarantine safely so that it's not continuously passed on uh, really is the way that we, um, that, we, that we keep everybody in our community safe and we bring those numbers down and we get kids back to school and folks back to work. Um, it is the most important thing that we can really do uh, next to masking and distancing and hand washing and, and you know, staying out of those big groups like we've talked about. And I know, Dr. Reeve, you know, we kind of talked about this before, but when we get students back uh, into school, there no doubt, you know, I know that there's some concern or people that have asked about, you know, will we see an increase because students are back? Are, are we seeing low cases right now because uh, students are not in school? The answer is yes, I mean, to a certain extent, right? But, um, but that, again, is, is something to be expected, and we don't think it will be something that spirals out of control. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, since we've been closely monitoring the data uh, and all of these, these strategies and prevention have been put in place, and Rob has said it, I've said it, we've all said it, transmission is extremely low in the schools. We're going to know. We're going to be following, and with Stephanie and the and the help teams monitoring of the kids that are that are positive, we're going to know very quickly with the availability of testing, and, and and so that we can eliminate that risk in the schools. We still need to pay attention, and I hope the parents are listening that they have a role in preventing their kids from going to school if they're sick. They also have a role of getting tested themselves. They have a role in and emphasizing the prevention strategies that we've all talked about, so that we're all, again, in this together. And maybe I'm gonna ask Taylor or Heather if they have anything else to add to that, because I, I do think they're, they're part of our team that's working with all of you directly. Uh, just echoing what Stephanie said, that a large part of this is making sure that we're not going to school and we're not feeling well, um, and making sure that if we, if we aren't feeling well, to report that to the school, um, and communicate with the school and communicate to our contacts so that we can avoid additional spread. It's a really big piece of it. Perfect. Thank you for adding that in. Um, you know, I did want to, so knowing that we might kind of see another increase and things might get crazy again, uh, Stephanie, how are you and your team preparing for that eventuality? You know, like we've talked, uh, you know, over and over again, this relationship that we have with uh, Boulder and Broomfield County Public Health Department is 
is just, it is really incredible. And it's something that is not uh, necessarily uh, seen throughout uh, the state. It's something I think that is really unique to our, uh, to our district and, and we really have benefited from that. Um, one of the opportunities that that has given us has been the ability for us over these last few weeks to come together with both of the health departments and really look at the processes that we put in place, the way that we communicate with each other, how we communicate internally with our nurses and our school staff. And so we've been able to really debrief and look at those processes, learn from those lessons um, and see what we can improve, a, improve upon. And really out of that uh, came the idea for our health monitors, um, the idea that um, you know some improved tracking systems for students that are ill or staff that are ill. We've been able to add additional nurses, thank you to our COVID team. Um, and we're really working to expand as we've talked about that ability for testing for students and staff. So uh, when somebody is ill, we can refer them to someplace you know, that's very close, that's free, that's accessible, that we know has really good quick turnaround um, when they have their tests done. And so that information, all of that will really help us, I think, um, as we come back, even with our numbers a little bit higher, um, you know, than maybe we'd like, we're gonna be able to uh, keep on top of things really well. I feel very confident. And I know uh, Dr. Anderson did, did mention about our classroom. And so we got the health monitors that are volunteers, uh, they're helping us, you know, track that, you know, health uh, conditions down if, if somebody's out sick. And then, uh, Margaret, we've got the classroom monitors, and they're really doing the work in the classroom of supporting if a teacher has to go home because of a quarantine. Yes, absolutely. And we're incredibly grateful to our community for stepping up and helping around that. We've had um, over 200 applicants, really very excited to have those individuals help us. They'll come in when our teaching staff is unable to be there. They'll help monitor our students um, while our teachers are working remotely and uh, just supporting and supervising, really needing their assistance. So we look forward to having them on board as well. And then um, I think what I, I had one last question for either staff or public health in regards to the idea that I know that the state's moving, it's uh, has changed its quarantine rules. And uh, we believe that that may help us to not have as many people out. Uh, is there anybody that can kind of explain what that will look like this time around? Sorry. Um, Heather, do you want to tackle that one or do you want me to do that? Yeah, I can uh, mention that. So as um, many of you are likely aware, the CDC had come out a couple of weeks ago with um, recommendations around shortened quarantine timelines. Um, it did take a little while for the state to weigh in on that, to think through um, what made the most sense, especially in our school settings. And so the recommendations that um, we've made from um, Boulder and Broomfield Public Health to the school districts is to look at um, 10 and 14 day quarantines. Um, and so I know that's um, what's been discussed um, and what they're looking at. And Stephanie, I don't know if you wanna add any additional specifics to that, but that's um, the updates from the public health side. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as with so many things with the pandemic, there's always a lot of changing information and it can be uh, confusing and uh, make people feel a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. I think what's really wonderful about this is that, um, you know, we've had almost a year now of uh, COVID and based on that, um, the information that we've, uh, we've gathered uh, CBC has been able to make this recommendation. And, and as folks know, there really are three different um, quarantine times. There's the kind of the gold standard, the 14 day, like Heather mentioned. Um, there is a, a shorter time period with um, a test that's done um, at a very specific time in that quarantine. And sometimes that can release people earlier. And then like Heather mentioned, I think the 10 day quarantine um, is really what we all feel is probably the best thing for most of our situations here in the schools. Um, and really, you know, what we're asking uh, is for this 10 day quarantine. So you're out for 10 days. If you're symptom free at 10 days, then you can come back with monitoring for the remainder um, of that 14 day period. And we have already built into our system the daily health check 
that all of our staff and students do, which really is monitoring for symptoms. And so we're asking um, our families and our staff to do that every day when they're coming to school. And so using that tool, I think, will really help people to kind of stop and, again, think through uh, how they're feeling, if they're having any COVID-like symptoms. Um, it's an ability to report those to us and, and to really think through. So um, I think having that in place, um, along with the 10-day quarantine, we're going to be at a, a very good place for folks to be able to maintain that time at home safely and get back a little bit quicker. And I, I don't know if you said this because I was looking down at questions, but I know that they, they're able, if they look at the class roster, like the uh, class seating chart, there might be some ability there. Did you did you touch on that? I'm apologizing. That's okay. No, I, I actually didn't. So you're right, Randy. Um, one of the other changes that came out through CDPAHE is the opportunity for us to do more targeted contact tracing. Um, so in the past, when we got to a certain level on the dial, we had to really look at the class as a whole. Um, that has changed now, again, you know, looking at the transmission rates in our schools, which are very, very low. Um, we've been able to, to say that even in the red level, we can look for anybody that's within that six feet kind of magic number during the class period and only quarantine those folks. Um, so that will also really reduce the number of kiddos that have to be home. Which is huge because I, I always use analogies, as you know, but it, it almost is like bowling a little bit. You just have these large groups of people just knocked out because, you know, the, the, the wideness of, of how hard, how far that needs to go. So that will be super helpful. I also don't want to, I do want to mention before I get into some of the parent questions here that, uh, Rob, I know that ventilation from the beginning has been a huge question mark. Uh, the, the question about, um, you know, some of the things that we've been doing, I know Rob mentioned testing. Uh, between that and the fact that uh, we're working on uh, air ventilators, uh, air purifiers in all of our rooms, I mean, you guys have a lot working right now. We've, we've got a lot. I will just start by saying thanks to all of our departments and operations. Uh, if it's maintenance or custodial or our bus drivers, um, we will be working solid uh, for the next two weeks getting our schools ready. So as Dr. Anderson mentioned a few times, um, just thanks to the state of Colorado, Colorado Department of Education, uh, last week we were awarded a $1.4 million grant that has allowed us to go out and purchase air purifiers for all classrooms, gymnasiums, cafeterias. Uh, those units, um, thousands of them will be distributed uh, starting next week. We actually had uh, two semi-loads come in today. We've got another two semi-loads coming in uh, early next week. But as everybody has talked about, this is just another layer in our risk reduction strategy. So um, as we're thinking about that, ventilation still plays a key piece in this. So does wearing masks, so does screening, so does washing our hands. Um, staying home sick as when we're sick is probably the most important. So just thinking through that, but air purifiers, uh, yeah, just thanks to Dr. Anderson's leadership, thanks to the state of Colorado allowing us to go out and buy those. Um, but yes, we will have those in place, Randy, uh, by January 4th. Um, a lot of work going in place. And then this uh, uh, testing, I just want to say COVID Check Colorado has been an amazing partner. Uh, they've been helping a lot of school districts. They've been providing testing uh, for Boulder Valley. It has not been as convenient as we had hoped. We've had sites up in Longmont. We've had sites in Westminster. Um, as Dr. Anderson mentioned, we will have a site that stood up on December 28th that is free uh, to the community. So it will be available uh, to our students, um, to media family members, staff, and we will encourage people to use it. We are also working to have some mobile testing sites set up. We will have those set up in January and more communication will follow on all of this. But really what we're trying to do is test as many people as we can just to make better decisions to keep our environment safer. So thank you, Randy. Perfect. And, and one of the questions we got was in regards to testing it, uh, John, who has an 11th grader, asked, why aren't rapid uh, tests being used as a safeguard? I know that this, we, we may very well do rapid tests, uh, but do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I will start, and then maybe Boulder County Health wants to jump in. Right now at the Centaur site, we will be doing nasal swab testing out there. And then the mobile testing that I talked about will be the saliva testing that is a bit quicker. Uh, Boulder County, would you like to comment on the rapid test? 
Sure, I think that's uh, thrown up to me there. Um, obviously, the nasal swab, the PCR test that we talk about, is probably the best test because it's the most accurate, particularly in folks that are asymptomatic. Now, uh, as an alternative, and I think that unfortunately that test takes two to three days to come back, and so that's part of the challenge. Having the rapid test, uh, like the Binax now, or and, and there's lots of lots of them out there. If you're asymptomatic, if you're symptomatic and you have close contact, it's a very accurate test, and so it's useful. And particularly, the rapid tests are useful, particularly for people who are ill, and and want to find out if they're infectious or they've been in contact. So that uh, that will be all explained to you when you go and get testing, uh, which is the best test. But I think we can certainly handle some of those questions. I know Stephanie knows this. Heather Taylor, we all have very lots of experience with uh, with tests. If there are further questions about that, okay. Thank you. I do have another one uh, that was probably on your side of the uh, of the, the arena here, uh, Dr. Urbina. Uh, the idea for social distancing. They they were asking about the fact that the CDC stated that uh, the six foot uh, uh, rule is outdated guideline, uh, which we do know because uh, right now we're we're playing off of three feet if possible. I think it's, it's typically what we have in our guidelines. Um, but I think as we talked about secondary students, I think that was something that we had in our in our information, and, and part of that was again a an additional um, layer of protection. Uh, and again, I think that's one of the questions that comes up is, is in regards to, I think we talked about that, uh, that there's a, a, some additional risk when it comes to those students. Uh, they're, they're a little bit more like adults as they get older. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know that's kind of a common question that we got today. Sure. Now, those are great questions. Physical distancing is one of those challenges, obviously. Um, the farther you away from somebody who's infectious, the better it is, because this respiratory is spread by droplets, by coughing, sneezing, et cetera. Um, uh, but it also can be spread just in the air, somebody singing, somebody talking. So that six feet is where we landed early. Obviously, if you're wearing a mask, if you're, <laughs> you're symptom checked, you're not ill, all of those layers actually help to so that one one of those variables that we talked about, whether or not it's physical distance or masking, is, is important, but they're all together. Like Rob Price had said earlier, adding the mechanical ventilation, adding the microfilters, adding the symptom checks, adding each of these pieces is important. So I feel very comfortable saying that in the schools, three feet is okay. Uh, and, and as you get a little bit older because of the closeness of those uh, socialization processes without going into details, uh, six feet is probably better. Smaller classroom size, still all the things that you've implemented are all safety issues, reduce the risk overall. So I'm comfortable saying three feet as long as all those other places, all those other layers of protection are in place. Um, and I, you did mention uh, about vaccination, of course, because uh, you know the vac uh, vaccines have just started rolling out here in Colorado. Uh, it definitely is top of mind, and we did get some questions about that. Uh, one is, you know, in regards to whether or not teachers were vaccinated, um, and also about children and how uh, how vaccines will roll out to them. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Let's handle the last one first. The last question is, none of the vaccines were studied in children. That is, none of the vaccines were studied in children. So now the Pfizer vaccine is going to be given in, to 16 years and older, although in Colorado it's probably going to be 18 years and older. The Moderna vaccine is also going to be an 18-year-old. So at this point, children do not have access to the vaccine. Now, because of that, uh, and this is emergency use authorization by the FDA, those clinical trials are starting right now. That is, they're enrolling children in those studies. So over the next couple months, probably spring to summer, we'll have better information about the safety and the effectiveness of the vaccine in children. So it may not help us in January, but hopefully it'll help us by next fall so we'll have a dose or a regimen for vaccines for children, for people, for, for uh, uh, kids that are under the age of 18. So that's one answer. The other answer is, when will the teachers get their shots? Boy, that's the million dollar question. We all wanna know when we're gonna be getting our shots. The, the rollout has just started Pfizer, we just got Pfizer vaccine last week. We're going to get Moderna vaccine next week. The doses are, the number of doses we've gotten is very small. 
So we're starting to roll those out based on health hospital workers, healthcare workers that are in very close contact with people that are infected, as well as those long-term care residents and, 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 and staff. So probably the most vulnerable populations first. As we get more and more vaccine, the next wave of folks, healthcare workers, first responders, uh, people that are, that are working with inmates, uh, congregate care shelters, we're going to be added to that next phase. Ultimately, teachers um, and, and other healthcare workers will be added in that second phase. Now, I am here to say that teachers, staff, administration, anybody who are working with children are a priority. It just has to be, be, be with because we have very few vaccines available. So hopefully by the spring, uh, February, March, we'll have more vaccines available. And we'll be talking about that, sharing that hopefully at a future Board of Education meeting, a future parent uh, or, or, or teacher staff and administration meeting in the future to talk about when that rollout is going to be made. The vaccine is safe and it's highly effective. We just don't know ha have enough doses yet left. So, or and yet. I should say before, you know, uh, it's just the idea that it's not, it's not a snap and suddenly you know, the cure-all, um, you know, A, you have to, have to take two vaccines and uh, you have to have a herd immunity. So th there, it, this is not something that overnight suddenly Colorado is going to be just green and, and safe. Thank you for mentioning that, Randy. I, I think that's important to emphasize. We still have to have these prevention strategies in place while we roll out the vaccine because it's going to be one to two weeks after you get the vaccine that you're going to actually be immune from the infection and from serious consequences if you do get the infection, because it doesn't prevent the infection in all people. And so that's part of the learning process that we're happening. So if you get your vaccine this week, Randy or Dr. Anderson, you're still not fully protected until about four weeks until after you get your second dose and a week or two after that. So we're opening schools. All these prevention strategies are, have to be in place and continue to do that over this next spring and summer while we get everybody vaccinated. And I know that we talk about herd immunity. Really, you have to get a significant number of people vaccinated uh, to, to consider herd immunity. And that means that everyone is protected. And, and unfortunately, not everyone will want the vaccine. So right now, I know that certain uh, two out of the three of you will say, yes, I want the vaccine. The other one out of three of you will say, no thanks, not for me. So we have to protect those individuals and the more people we vaccinate, the more we put in the prevention strategies, the better and safer we'll all be. And I would be remiss not to mention, uh, Superintendent Anderson, this is, you know, as a superintendent, that's one of the things that you get to do as part of your position is, is really kind of advocate in certain areas, uh, policy and, and things like this. Absolutely. And, and as Dr. Urbina shared, I'll be advocating to the extent that I'm able to, to um, to do that for, for all of um, our employees that have direct contact to, to be able to be on that list and be prioritized. I think that's really important. I know that this is a priority for the governor, priority for, um, for our community. And so we'll continue to push, push and work with other superintendents. And I think that you've seen, you know, several of the superintendents in Denver Metro have been have working together to try to you know, push some of these things out as priorities. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, Dr. Abina is right, though, that there's only so many vaccines that come in and there has to be a priority and a ranking. Um, but we do feel like that all of our educators, whether you're a bus driver, custodian, office staff, administrator, teacher, um, all of those positions are critical for us to be able to operate. We have no bus drivers, we can't get kids to school. If you have no office staff, you can't operate a school. Um, all are critical, and so we'll continue to advocate for those. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to jump over to the academic world because we got uh, a number of questions in that area. So, uh, Margaret, uh, our area superintendent, I do, I do want to ask you a few things. One is uh, a question from a, a mother uh, over at uh, Metal Arc uh, in regards to, can we continue re remote learning, uh, or is that not an option anymore? Of course, remote learning is part of this picture, right? Yes, absolutely. For those families who have been working through remote learning, uh, we would certainly, we certainly are going to continue the remote learning. If you have questions about your status or where you are, what that looks like around remote learning or home learning, definitely just reach out to your school administration. Uh, we've had some families reach out just to connect and check, make sure that everything is the same as it should be. Um, and we welcome those calls. We want to make sure that our families feel very connected to their school as we're headed back after winter break. 
we have definitely gotten a few folks that are that are asking the types of questions of, you know, I sort of redshirted my my freshmen because they only were going one day a week. I, you know, they're on a line, but they do want to go back now because it's you know two days a week. Uh, talk to the talk to the administrator, right? Um, yeah. Similarly, um, you know, we had another person that asked the question of, they're, they're you know, again, uh, and understandably, we asked the question to to uh, public health or earlier about, you know, the the impact of the holidays and waiting and seeing. Uh, what, what's your feedback to folks in, in regards to if they're they're feeling uneasy and, and want to come back to in person, but maybe don't want to be there the first days back? Certainly what I would do is let your administrators know kind of where you are and what you're looking at. We would welcome our families to come back, um, but we also recognize that there has to be a level of comfort. Uh, we did send notice that we, if your child wasn't attending um, and was slated to attend, please make sure that if they're able, they're attending school. We certainly know the best place for our kids is to be in school in their learning environment. Uh, but we also work with families all the time. And we recognize that we want to make sure people feel comfortable and safe in, in their educational experience. So definitely reach out to your school administrators or your school counselors if you're a, a middle or high school student or elementary as well they certainly can help um, process where we are and, and where your family is. Uh, we did just get a question from a parent that asked, uh, they heard us talking about the seating chart solution. I know this is something that you and, and your team have been working at, you know, with the schools. Um, they were kind of asking about, you know, is this even reasonable in, in a place like an elementary school? Um, and that, that may, you know, grade to grade may, may be different, right? Absolutely. And we certainly, um, we would love to have our K-12 um, students have their seating charts. Even if we think back, you know, when I was teaching, we had a seating chart in case we had a fire drill and who do we call and what does that look like and who's missing? What we're asking for to, to um, simplify and streamline the system is that uh, the seating charts, our staff will be placing them in our, in our um, warehouse system so that our health services, people can find it really easily just so that they can do a check and balance. We do know that kids travel in groups and they have within their seating chart, they may be in a pod right now or they may be in rows or they may be in a group just to the level of um, expectation around where they're mostly sitting is what we're looking for. And really at the end of the day, it just helps us uh, make sure that the kids that are able to stay in school can stay in school and that those students that might be impacted are notified quickly and that the staff is notified quickly. It's really just another measure uh, to make sure that we're connecting as much as possible um, with our families and keeping our kids safe. We did also get a number of questions in regards to Mondays, and I know that there was a recent uh, op-ed in the paper that um, it might be related to this, but uh, the question, you know, uh, when will we start live school on Mondays again? Um, you know, questions in regards to what teachers are doing during that time. Are they truly engaged in professional development? Um, considering the, you know, limited curriculum uh, being provided through online learning this semester, um, you know, or can we reconsider having Mondays off? Um, can you kind of tell us a little bit about what Mondays do look like and, and also how we've sort of renegotiated teachers' schedules um, in the back and forth of, of coming back and forth from uh, in-person versus, you know, online and all that kind of thing? Sure. Certainly moving forward, you know, our Mondays are imperative for our teachers. There are lots of district opportunities that we've had in the past um, to allow for our teachers to work on professional learning, their planning for the week, their grading systems, their meetings. There are a variety of things that happen during a teacher's plan time or during a teacher's day. And what we wanted to make sure was that the teachers had that availability because when we're transitioning in and out of home learning and in-person learning, that planning time, that ability to connect with other teachers, that ability to connect in professional learning is diminished because we really want to make sure that our students are engaging in their learning and we want our teachers available. As we're headed back to the buildings, we are going to keep continue the Monday launch day. Uh, one of the benefits that we have found for it, um, and you know, not in every situation has it been perfect, and we certainly recognize that, but our goal is that our students are having the opportunity to launch their learning for the week. When you're coming in and out of a system, you want to make sure there's plenty of transition in and out through that process. And I'll use as an example, many of our elementary school teachers have limited, um, when they're in home learning, have limited access for their planning or their own um, their own availability for scoring and things like that, that, that we would do, those ends up being done much later in the evening and on weekends when they're also trying to manage their own family pandemic um, situations that may be coming up. In middle schools is another example where they, because of the back-to-back -back coursework, the teachers really came alongside us and, and um, committed to trying to have that flexibility to have all day with their students. And at the same time, that leaves them with limited plan time um, within their day. So one of the benefits of having the Monday launch day. And of course, we always are reevaluating and evaluating where we are and how we can make improvements. So the feedback is really important to us. 
um, as we make modifications moving forward. I think this might actually be a, a great final question that I'll pose back to the superintendent, if that's okay, which is uh, a parent that's already looking ahead, uh, and maybe it's actually a mix up between you and Margaret, but already looking ahead at August and wondering, are we coming back in August? Our hope is of course, right? <laughs> Here's, here's what I, I, I know today. I know that there's a vaccine. I know that there will be access, uh, widespread access to the vaccine as long as everything holds true, uh, end of spring, beginning of summer. Um, I, I do know that, that we are anticipating that cases will continue to, to go down. You know, our hope is that 2021 is a much more normal year. I think that in our initial planning that we'll continue to have an online option for those still not comfortable uh, and so so that we would uh, but but they may not be it may not look the way that, that it's looking uh, this year Margaret can speak to that but um, August is a long ways away we've got a lot of a lot of time in between now and then uh, and like I said earlier you know our focus is when we hit the ground running in August you know school can't look different I, I mean school has to look different it can't look the same as when we left because we have a different scenario. Not only do we have kids that are gonna have academic gaps, social need, new social emotional needs, we have a lot of kids that weren't even with us for the past year. You know, 1,600 kids are learning somewhere else. Many of those kids we anticipate will come back to us. And so we're going to have to work over the course of the next uh, four, five, six months collaboratively with our educators to figure out what the new and improved school will look like for it in, in 2021. Uh, but I appreciate that question. I can tell you that that's something that we're doing a lot of thinking about. Uh, Margaret, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, as we're anticipating what that might look like, what the, the different options might look like um, in August 2021? Absolutely. Thanks very much for that, and I'll do it in less than one minute. So uh, to launch first, we recognize that lots of families have felt very comfortable with having the home learning um, and being connected to their school. So we're working hard to continue that option for our families and at the same time, recognizing that centralizing that opportunity for our families so that there's fluid communication and their systems of connection while still being engaged with their home learning school is key. So we're working on branching out some of that information that'll be coming in the beginning of January. As with most years, we're already planning for August. Um, I would also say that we re totally recognize the benefit of getting our kids back and recognizing the need for transition and being fluid as we're mo moving forward. And then certainly our kids that are ready and, and coming back right away, if we open in August 100%, which is what we're all certainly hoping for, families will have that option as well. So you'll start to see kind of a three-prong approach as we're moving forward into next year, and we're really excited to be rolling this out. It's really tough to see the silver lining in a lot of our opportunities in schools, but we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of the feedback, moving us forward, and enhancing our educational opportunities for our students moving forward. Thanks very much, Randy, and I appreciate the um, opportunity to answer. Thank you, Margaret, and I appreciate the superintendent. Um, I'll make this my last question because I know we are over time right now, uh, but it, 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 you know, the natural uh, tendency, I think, for a lot of us, including parents, is, is to really want to have, you know, very, very specific entrenched uh, data points that you can look at and say, okay, if it hits this specific number or that kind of thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm posing this to, to Dr. Rabina. I know that as we've worked, uh, you know, one of the things that we've talked about is the fact that, that things have changed as we've gotten to know the, the virus and as uh, the cases have grown, you know, the, the severity in which we consider something, um, you know, concerning and the dial actually has even changed. It wasn't around forever, it just came up uh, and then it changed within you know, a very short amount of time because they realized that they needed to, to accommodate some additional things. Uh, this is a moving, I, I don't know if it's okay for me to say, but it's a bit of a moving target and something that we're looking at a lot of data points, uh, not specifically setting one to say whether or not schools are open, but it's this communication, it's the conversation, it's the, the warning flag that then we talk about and make the decisions together that matter, right? Absolutely. I'm not sure what the question is, but I have a comment. <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean, the idea is that we're, that we're looking at a lot of things uh, yeah, sure. to make a decision together. Well, one of the valuable things that Dr. Anderson started out in having this discussion is our collaborative efforts between uh, Boulder County Public Health, uh, Bloomfield Public Health, uh, our schools, our teachers, our parents. That really is the key. If you, if you have that collaboration and then you have the cooperation of how we reduce the, uh, the spread of the infection in the community while we reduce the opportunities for the infection to get into our schools, 
then we really have a collective a opportunity, and the data will will show itself. Frankly, we'll see a decrease in the incidence uh, incidence of the disease. That means at that one time period, how many cases we're having. We'll see a decrease in the positivity of all the tests. We'll see a decrease in hospitalizations. We'll see a decrease in deaths. All of those are data points that if we do all the things that we've talked about, then we're going to have a successful uh, 2021 going forward as we add the layer of vaccine. So it's just not one data point. It's all the things that we've talked about today that are key to our success. And, and it's really all of us working together uh, to make that happen. And I think that's where I thought you were going with this. I Hopefully I answered your question. You did perfect. Uh, and that's where I wanted to really end it on is our collaboration and, and our work together. And as we started the conversation, we want to thank Boulder County and, and Broomfield County Public Health for their partnership in this. We can't do it without them. Uh, Rob, is there any last words I, sh I should ask you before I, I close up here? No, thanks, Randy. Thanks, everybody who's tuned, who's tuned in. Uh, continue to stay um, up to date with the information. We look forward to having kids back in person in January. Again, thanks to everybody on the call, and happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, panel, uh, for being here. I hope you have a great night. Happy holidays. Bye.